Welcome to the Law Awareness Week at CDC 2022. This webinar is part of the Law Awareness Week at CDC 2022. It is a collaboration between the Law Society Pro Bono Services, the five Community Development Councils, the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law, the Singapore University of Social Sciences School of Law, the Singapore Management University School of Law, and the Singapore Corporate Council Association Pro Bono Chapter, supported by the People's Association. I'm Samson, and I'll be your host for this webinar this evening. Today's webinar is Believe It or Not, How to Spot and Avoid Scams. And first, before we start, let's have some housekeeping issues. Um, today, we'll be using Pigeonhole Live for the Q&A sessions. Uh, you can submit your question at any time during the webinar and also upvote any questions that you like. Uh, number two, if you have a smartphone or a tablet with you, just launch to your internet browser and type the URL www.pigeonhole.at as you see on the screen. And the event passcode is LawCDC02 as you see on the slide. Alternatively, you can click on the link that's being shared um, in the chat function to launch your Pigeonhole Live uh, on your website. A link will be provided in the chat function later to assess any of the handouts uh, that the participants will be sharing later on in this webinar. And the link will also be in the follow-up email later this evening. Lastly, please note that today's discussion is not intended to substitute for any legal professional advice. Please consult your lawyer if you have any specific questions. And with that, I would like to introduce to you our two panelists today, um, Nicholas and Eunice. Um, Nicholas has 20 years of diverse experience, uh, being a co-founder and board member in businesses, nonprofits, and in the government. He worked for Fortune 500 CEOs, heading up the region for an investor in a digital first education, and, lead, and he led a regional team for Visa, supporting some of the biggest internet businesses like Tencent, Alibaba, Ctrip, and C manage their risks in digital transactions. He is also a member of the National Crime Prevention Council, a nonprofit organization committed to promoting public awareness of and concern of crime and to propagate the concept of self-help in crime prevention. Next, we have Eunice Chua, who is the Chief Executive Officer of FIDREC and a research fellow at the Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy. She was previously an Associate Professor of Law at the Singapore Management University School of Law and the Deputy CEO of the Singapore International Mediation Centre. Eunice has also served as an assistant registrar of the Supreme Court and a magistrate of the state courts. Her areas of expertise include dispute resolution, evidence, and procedure. Nicholas and Eunice, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And to you in the audience, thank you for tuning into this webinar today. Um, by the end of this session, we hope that you leave with three things. The first one, you know some of the top scams of 2022. Number two, you know some of the impact and how this affects all of us. And lastly, you'll be going with us on a journey together to look how some of these scams work and how to spot them and what you can do during, before, during, and after those scams. And with that, let's get started. Now let's look at some of the top um, scam types of the first half of 2022. Here's some statistics that's being shared by the Singapore Police Force on the 29th of August, 2022. And you can see some of the top scams that's really affecting all of us. I'll just pause on this slide so that you in the audience can take in some of these numbers. And now a question to Nicholas. In some of the work that you do with the police, um, what are some of these scams that you are seeing? And what do you think is some of the reasons for why these top scams of 2022 is happening? Well, I think, uh, you know, Singapore, we, we, we've been a um, very safe society. You know, we always count ourselves as being very safe. But uh, in my work, as a, not just with the police, but with the, the corporates, right, the, the syndicates, 
have really come come out significantly in the past many years actually and um, they are they're not decreasing they're increasing in in their activities um, it must be because the payoff is significant as you can see from some of the, the numbers right uh, hmm. some of these schemes that we're seeing uh, they're losing tens of millions of dollars mm. uh, single cases can mm. be losing like four million five million dollars it's, 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 so it's really lucrative really really really, really lucrative syndicates. and i always say it's like it's like a man on the street mm. has very little chance sometimes against a, a professional syndicate and yes. the minute the scheme is discovered they can switch very very quickly mm. and even with covid it didn't slow down in fact because some of these are uh, trans um, geography, trans transnational. Yeah. They they don't have to be here, and that makes the job of the law enforcement actually a lot more difficult. Mm. And Nicholas, what do you think are some of these factors that has contributed to such a rise in these top scams of twenty twenty two? There are quite a few. Um, maybe I'll just name name a couple. I think the the, the increase in uh, digital technologies, e commerce. Right, everyone was uh, at home doing shopping some people are trying out we're trying out shopping for the e-commerce for the first time and and they're not quite used to 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 the environment of what what is real what is not um you know some people may have also uh, due to the shift uh, created by covid or the pandemic right lost their jobs and then unwittingly right got into uh the other side <laughs> mm. uh, right being a being a fake merchant or or, or a meal or scamming others uh uh, unwittingly because they you know uh, so uh, the the shift to digital has actually definitely created a, a lot of, a lot of these um, mm. um so nicholas the shift to digital is really causing uh this kind of rise in the online digital scams that we are seeing and uh, Eunice, what 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 do you see um what do you think are some of those factors that you see in your everyday work mm, i definitely agree with um, nicholas that with the move to digital, it leaves a lot of consumers quite vulnerable. And the police have also told us that more than 90% of the scams that our people face here in Singapore originate from outside Singapore. So Singapore is becoming uh, one of the targets for these um, organized crime syndicates. And so in order to be able to protect ourselves better, we really have to arm ourselves with knowledge. It's like getting a vaccine for COVID-19, yes. right? And I think that is why we're having the webinar today. Yeah. So the vaccine, um, this, this is our first shot. Our first shot. Our first right. shot. Be sure to tune in for the rest of the uh, Law at CDC uh, webinars where you can get your booster shot and maybe even your second booster shot. <laughs> and now, at, at a high level, right, uh, Nicholas and uh, Eunice, what, what are some things which your organizations, be it the National Crime <laughs> Prevention Council or in FIDRAC, what are some of the things that you as an organization are doing to help combat this rise in, in scams? Well, at NCPC, we... Um, we are very focused on protecting right, our citizens. Uh, um, the work is uh, multi-layered in terms of uh, education is obviously a key. Right? And uh, we've recently worked with uh, some of the banks to create the bank a scam quiz and all that. So a lot of educational, you see our efforts in Crime Watch, right? very, very popular. Uh, you see our banners, our posters. Uh, we have a website called scamalert.sg. Right? Scamalert.sg. That's right. Um, Actually, it's really, really interesting, right? Scamalert.sg provides a lot of information, but mm. also allows you to submit uh, your own stories. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, yes. and then to, to help to, to, to protect uh, fellow Singaporeans, right? I was just looking yeah. at it, like even some of the top scams, like job scams. I, I saw one, one different scheme being reported every day for the past few days, right? Mm. <laughs> on on scamalert.sg. But we also try to go beyond just the educational side of things. We try to uh, see, can we come up with more... Uh, a direct intervention. So, uh, for example, we have a hotline right now uh, where you can call in and and kind of check. And then the the officers who man the hotline actually sit next to the police officers who, who man the police hotline. Mm. So, so we try to 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 shorten the distance between uh, how we support um, people calling for inquiries and and direct action. That's that's one thing. Uh, we also have uh, launched Scam Scam Shoe, which is a uh, quite a popular app the on Scam iOS, app. and yes. we had a lot of requests coming through. When are we going to launch the Android one? And I'm just happy to, if you saw the news that we just launched the Scam Shoe app for Android. Yep, uh, I've just downloaded, just downloaded it. Just downloaded it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yes. it's been very helpful. I yes. think, I think uh, for me as iOS user, right, you, the number of uh, 
calls and, and SMSs and this has been reduced uh, significantly. And we're looking at many, many other ways in which we can uh, step up our efforts. Nico, tell, me, tell me more about this, this Scam Shield app. So if someone in our audience today were to download it, um, where can they get it and what does it do? Mm. How so does if, it help? If you have an iOS user, you yeah. download from the iOS app store. or And then if you're a Android user, download from the Google Play store. And basically, you it's set up a bit differently on, on both environments. But once you get it set up, basic, basically... It will, uh, when uh, the next text or the next call comes in, mm. it will basically compare against a, a database, right? The uh, which uh, is maintained by, uh, by us together with the uh, GovTech, right? And of of um, uh, those that have look suspicious or or have been reported in the past as as being uh, uh, scamish or, or fraudulent and all that, and and filters out for you. I so it, it should get the database should get enriched over time, and more and more people should be. Get, get better protection. Right? So it's yes. sort of like a like a spam blacklist. spam filter yes. but for your handphone for your uh, SMS uh, a blacklist uh, blacklist protection for uh, for your mobile phone that that yeah. is maintained by NCPC and and GovTech. Ah, oh, that sounds so interesting. Yeah. In fact, one feature of this app that I've started using and that I like is the report a scam yes. feature. Uh, because normally you feel quite helpless, or yes. when a message comes in, you can choose to ignore. Yes. But now with Scam Shield, you can choose to report. You just key in the email or the phone number. Mm, you key mm. in a brief description. You just send it off. And hopefully, all this contributes to the database that's and right, can stop right. you know, these horrible messages from reaching people. Yes, it's a, it's, it's a, a form of community protection, right? Everyone's yes. proud, uh, the more uh, you're vigilant in reporting, mm. but you're also protecting your, your, your fellow friends and family or fellow Singaporeans. That's right? very true. So all of us can play a part in fighting against scams and contributing to this larger database of what suspicious transaction, uh, suspicious SMSs and suspicious messages look like. Mm -hmm. So please, let's do our part. Um, we can download the Scam Shield app uh, available on iOS and Android. And next, Eunice, tell us more about what Fidrek has been doing, especially with such, um, with the rise in the, the scams in 2022. Thanks, Samson. For Fidrek, for those who may not be familiar with the acronym, uh, let me just explain that it stands for Financial Industry Disputes Resolution Centre. What we do is we handle disputes between consumers, so this, these would be ordinary people like you and me, and financial institutions in Singapore, including banks, insurers, financial advisors, and so on. So what we try to do is where a consumer uh, runs into a problem with, uh, in this context, it's usually the banks, right, with scams, because they have lost some money from their bank account, or maybe their credit cards, um, there have been transactions that they did not approve, they did not authorize. So when they go to the bank first, sometimes they may not be able to resolve it directly. And that is where they can come to FIDREC for help. We are an independent organization that uh, is designated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore to resolve all these disputes between consumers and financial institutions. We have quite a simple process and now we've gone online. So you can file any inquiry or complaint online on our FIDREC website. And after we receive the complaint, um, someone will then look into it to examine whether FIDREC can handle it. With scams, sometimes we are not able to handle because the consumer comes to us and the complaint is against maybe a foreign entity and we are not mm. able to have any control over them or invite them to come and join our dispute resolution process. So this might be a reason why we cannot handle uh, a complaint. But mm. if we can, then it goes on to the second stage of mediation. And this is where, as you can see from the icon, it is about trying to talk through and find a solution. Our mediators are all trained at FIDREC and they are experts in financial disputes and they are able to bring their perspective to help to guide the conversations. And generally, we can complete um, the cases at mediation about 75% of the time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm. And we still have another stage as you can see on the screen, if a dispute cannot settle at mediation. Mm. And we call that adjudication, which is a longer way of saying that some independent expert will review the claim and then 
give an opinion on whether the claim is a valid one. Uh, and so at mediation, uh, there is absolutely no cost to the consumer. It's, it's mm. free. You can file a complaint. You can have someone look into it and help you along this negotiation process with no charge. For adjudication, we have a small fee and that is so that the consumer is prepared to go through the adjudication process, which requires some effort because you have to prepare submissions. You may have to come for a hearing. Uh, and so this uh, nominal fee of $50 per claim uh, is to help people to fully understand what they're getting themselves into. Mm. Yeah, so that is what we do at FIDREC. I see. Thanks, Eunice. So this, this FIDREC is for when a consumer like ourselves, if we have a particular disagreement with our bank and our financial institution. And then that's where they come to you, Feedback, as sort of a third-party mediator and adjudicator. Exactly right, Samson. I see. Okay. Well, with that, um, you know, scams don't just only affect the people who suffer from it. And it has a ripple effect as well. So, um, that's something which, you know, I like to ask Nicholas, right? Like um, scams, I know most obviously we know that the victims lose their money. Uh, but in those cases where you have um, seen with the police and your work with NCPC, how, what, 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 what do you see and what are those possible effects which probably go so much more than just a loss of money? Like, why is this important? There was, <clears throat> there was a case shared to me by actually a colleague from another, another jurisdiction, another country, said mm. that when the um, they went to the mule's house, the police officers went to the mule's house, um, and the mule was in total denial that, mm. uh, you know, insisted that, that he was in love, right? I and see. was in total denial. And then when he finally realized he was, he went, was totally distraught, right? The, the kind of emotional impact, right? Uh, actually, sometimes it's uh, always the, the financial impact case, right? And because, um, Again, right, due to especially magnified through uh, through the pandemic, people mm. could not meet each other. A lot of relationships were and trust was built online. Right. So Nicholas, he got tricked. He got tricked, and he fell in love with exactly someone that turned out to be a scammer. That turned out to be a sc scammer, right? Wow. And, yeah. So the yeah. the um, the kind of um, uh, emotional uh, mm. impact, and then mm. also besides that, right, the impact to to family members. Mm. Right. Some of them could end up. Uh, borrowing from, uh, from family members or friends mm. right, just to because they, they, they really believed mm. that uh, they were doing something that was uh, um, legitimate or something that was actual but actually turned out to be a scam and, and the, the strain to to uh, family ties relationships could be significant yeah. as well so it's not really it's really not just about the money it's not right? just about the money that's right Eunice what are some of those uh, cases that you've seen like how, how does it really impact um, the victim and the wider, the wider family and society. Mm. At, at FITREC, uh, maybe about more than half of the cases that are filed against banks have to do with scams and fraud. Mm. And we see that the victims can be anyone. Mm. They can be someone who is a teacher. They can be a tech professional working for a tech company. Mm. They can be a single mother. These victims, um, they... they can be anyone. And so I think when we see them come to FIDREC, yes. our first role is really to listen and to understand what their claim is about. Many times we find that the victims don't want to inform their family members. Mm. And they come to FIDREC without telling and they are very worried. They feel guilty sometimes. They feel fearful. Um, they also may feel embarrassed because we read about scams in the papers yes. and to realize that you have been a victim is also something that is sometimes emotionally difficult to bear. Mm. And so sometimes at FIDREC, we may refer people who need some counseling um, to this uh, national resource. Uh, okay. We will share that in the link later where there is a website that anyone can go to if you need any sort of psychological support and counseling. And there is also a hotline that specifically deals with scam cases that's um, done by NCPC. And you can call 1-800-722-6688 if you need to talk to anyone about 
a scam that you are facing. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing, Nicholas, and thanks for sharing, Eunice. And for this next part, let's join us on a journey for some of the top scams in 2022. And for each of these, we'll be looking at the before, during, and after. And Nicholas and Eunice will be sharing some of their insights and what you should do at, at those stages. Now, for this first scenario, it's a typical job scam. Um, I'll, I'll just read this out. Mr. Lee has been unemployed since the pandemic. And when he lost his job, he sent in a lot of job applications, but he was unfortunately unable to secure a job or interview. And so at the point where he was at his darkest, he received a text message. You know, and the text message said that he can work part-time and earn up to $300 a day. So uh, there was a link in the message. And in his moment of desperation, he clicked on the link. It brought him over to a, a website and he was required to pay a $1,000 activation fee in order to start his job. And Mr. Lee, you know, he, he, he found a way to get the $1,000 even though he was unemployed already. And he, he did all the tasks that was written on the website, right? Like clicking a certain box, buying a certain thing from an e-commerce site. He did all of these. And after a week, you know, in the website, he started seeing his earnings go up and up and up. But when he tried to withdraw those earnings, that was when he realized that he might have been scammed because um, the, the, the withdrawal failed. The website later became broken. When he tried calling the, the, the employer's customer support line, it was just went silent. This is a, it's a very, very, very challenging kind of situation, right? For Mr. Lee, who has been, you know, lost his job during the COVID situation and now desperately trying to find an income and he, he just paid this $1,000 and did all this work and got nothing back. Now, a question to Eunice. You know, Mr. Lee was in such a desperate situation and the, the text message really seems to be such a good opportunity, right? What, what should Mr. Lee have done when he received such a message? Okay, so we are rewinding to the pretend before. the before when you just receive a message out of the blue. Out of the blue. I think I would suggest three steps. Right? And these three mm. steps are generally applicable to any time you receive something out of the blue okay. or you are asked to purchase a financial product or enter into some kind of transaction where you need to part with your money. Okay? Mm. And these three steps are ask, check, confirm. So the first thing Mr. Lee could do is to ask the person who messaged him for more information about this job. Right? Which is the company? What is the name of the company that he'll be working for? How is the company going to pay him? You know, how can he withdraw his earnings when he is able to? So ask questions. And when you find that the person cannot answer your questions or mm. is a bit stuck, then alarm bells can start going off and you know that there might be something wrong. I see. The second step is to check, mm. right? So if, for example, the person who made the job offer says, I'm from XYZ company, go to XYZ company directly, not through the same person, mm. not through the number mm. or website that this person gives you, but go online, right? Mm. Check for the information about this company. I see. And you might realize that actually there was no job offer made to you and there's no such job. Mm. So okay. XYZ might actually say, no, we're not really looking for anything. I didn't send out any SMS. Yes, that's right. I see. Okay. And the third step to be safe is to confirm. Okay. And where do you confirm against? You go to NCPC's scamalert.sg. Ah, and as Nicholas yes. said, right? If you go to the website these few days, you see a similar pattern. There are quite a number of similar job scams that are coming up. Hmm. And when you look at those, you can then also realize that, oh, perhaps yours might be a scam scenario as well and not a mm. genuine one. So before you part with your money, do these three steps of ask, check, and confirm. Ah, thanks for sharing, Eunice. So that's our takeaway for today. Uh, for, for these kind of scams, which Eunice has shared, generally applicable for any type of scam. Number one, ask. Ask more questions for the, uh, to the scammer and see how, how deep how deep the rabbit hole goes. Number two, check. Check against independent sources. 
and then last confirm confirm on the public websites search whether there's really such a job or search whether maybe other people have post, posted their own stories on scamalert.sg ah. now the question to Nicholas here is uh, I'm sure NCPC has received a lot of such stories right, since we're talking about the scam alerts or SG. Um, if, if Mr. Lee is in this situation and he's really reached a stage where uh, he tried to withdraw and the money is not coming and the, the, the whole website is MIA, what can he do? Yeah, I think when, whenever there is a monetary loss, right, mm. um, uh, you, should, you should make a police report. And um, when you when you report, you you should try to get as much of your information, right? About uh, how you were contacted in the first place, um, the URLs, emails, uh, WhatsApp exchanges, Telegram exchanges. Try to compile everything uh, and uh, give it um, give these details when you make the police report. Actually, uh, since Unis <laughs> uh, so kindly highlighted the scam alert. Yes, and I actually want to kind of just highlight some couple of additional points. Uh, if you go to scamalert.sg and you see the under scam types, you see actually job scams, which is what we are talking at, uh, looking talking about, right? And you you will see that uh, up to uh, end of last year, there were like more than four thousand five hundred victims, ninety one million dollars was lost, and the largest amount lost by an individual in a job scam was four point three million dollars, right? Um, you know you can learn about the 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 scheme itself. What are some of the 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 signs to look out for, how to stay stay safe. And as we mentioned, we actually allow users like yourself, myself, to kind of like share your story. And I'm just taking a look at the stories shared for the past three days. Uh, there's a jobs, there's a scam to uh, for a job to review hotels. Mm. Uh, that's a job scam that was received on uh, Telegram where every day you have to do 25 tasks and everybody on the Telegram is like, Encouraging each other on, right? All, all fake. And then there's a job scam on uh, Instagram, right? And then uh, to, to help with uh, some European sounding name uh, job and all that. So, so mm. lots of uh, different schemes. And it sounds all very believable, right? Like if you pay me to review a, a, a hotel website, it does sound like, you know, mystery shopping. That's, that's, a, that's like a legitimate type of. Uh, activity that businesses try to do. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these kind of job scams actually do sound quite reasonable on the face of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, there's uh, three steps that you have yes. highlighted about to us. Uh, check and confirm. I think it's very helpful. Mm. If I can also just kind of highlight a couple of uh, points peculiar to, I think, job scams, right? Some, um, if they ask for money first, payment first, uh, normally that's a, that's a problem. That's if, it's a, if they promise you high pay, but actually low effort or low commitment, yeah. that, that should ring an alarm bell. Um, if it's unsolicited, right, you, you were not actually uh, sending out resumes or contacting this company and then mm. the company comes and contact you, right? That, and that that's also should, strange. That's also strange, you ask yourself, yeah. right? Or, or if the, they're not able to explain the job description very well, right? It's, it's, it's very, very, very big, right? Mm. Or they're asking you for a lot of personal information or asking you to transfer money uh, before, yeah. before anything. So these are some of the... the Science that you should watch out for. Yeah, it does seem quite strange if I'm trying to apply for a job and yet I need to pay the employer like a few hundred or a thousand dollars before that. That's just really strange, right? T talking about yeah. it not sounding strange, uh, there was one scheme, I think it was uh, on Scam Alert as well. Yes. Where I think they were recru recruiting for male escorts <laughs> and they promised that they'll give you high paying or wealthy uh, clients, but you have to pay a registration fee. So it's, uh, there's, there's always playing to a certain aspect of uh, motivation, greed. I know. see. Yeah. Okay. All right. And now maybe moving on to the next scenario. We have scenario two, which is a phishing scam. This is the second one. And in this scenario, it's uh, Joe has a banking account with a, with a bank. And he received a text message claiming that there was an issue with his iBanking account. And in that message, there was a link that he can click to resolve the matter. And so when he clicked on the link, he was asked to enter his username and password on a website that looks kind of like his internet banking site. And so he just did that. And a few days later, he, uh, when he entered in everything, he didn't hear anything back from the bank. But only a few days later, when he checked his account, he realized that his account had multiple withdrawals. 
And all these were done without his knowledge. So this, uh, again, Joe, from Joe's point of view, he just received the message and the message was saying that the bank wanted to confirm some things. He logged into a website that looked like his internet banking website. Nothing majorly amiss, but the money is gone. Now, Eunice, the question to you is that, you know, this is becoming one of the uh, one of the, the top scams of 2022, these kind of phishing scams where, where the scammers pretend they have a website that kind of looks and feels like the internet banking website and they trick people to enter the username and password. What, what do you observe, Eunice, that there are some of the things that the banks have been doing to step up? to fight against this kind of crime this year? Mm. I think um, most of us have read in the papers or heard on the radio about how the Monetary Authority of Singapore has worked together with the Association of Banks in Singapore to come up with various measures to make it more difficult for the scammers to get at our hard-earned money. And I think three one, three that I really want to draw your attention to that you can use to better protect yourself. The first one is please be aware that banks um, and other government organizations will now remove um, these clickable links from their emails and SMSs. There are a few exceptions. So, for example, um, Sing Health has said that. Um, in their messages to remind people of their medical appointments, they still have a link there to make it easier for people to kind of, you know, reschedule or to mm. cancel. Um, but for banks, generally, this should not be the case. There should be no clickable links in SMSs or emails that come from banks. Mm. So when you do receive something, then you should be concerned <laughs> and you should try and find out more to see whether this is genuine or not. Yeah. The second thing to bear in mind is that this is something that is not done yet for some banks, but will definitely be rolled out by the end of October, according to the press release. And this is a kill switch. Okay, And what this means is that there is a way for consumers to freeze their account. When they do and activate this kill switch, then no money can go out of their account anymore. Right, mm. So there's already one local bank that has rolled this out. The others will probably follow suit soon. And this is something that we should bear in mind, especially in Joe's scenario, where his account is already losing money. Yes. Yeah? So yes. the very first thing Joe should do, even before he calls the police, is to quickly activate this kill switch if there mm. is, or contact his bank to ask them to immediately stop all transactions from the account. And this is what you can do to stop yourself from losing even more money. Right? So I the see. first thing, you go to your bank or you stop any money from going out of your account. Freeze your account. Freeze it. Yeah. Then you have time. You can always make your police report. For mm. that part, um, the time sensitivity is not so great. And you can do that online or you can go to the nearest neighborhood police center. I see. So that's the second thing to bear in mind. Okay. And that is kill switch kill or switch. calling your bank's hotline to quickly suspend and freeze your account. I see. So Eunice, first is don't click on any links that come from SMSs because banks don't give any more SMSs with the links. And number two, if you find out that there's been unauthorized withdrawals, he should activate the kill switch or just call the bank and say, freeze my account because unauthorized transactions. Yes. You know, and, and Eunice, there's this one question that then came from the audience, which is, you know, how much responsibilities that... um. It, how much responsibility is on the bank and the FI and then how much is on us as a, as a consumer? I think for this one, um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has made it quite clear that both the consumer and the financial institution have responsibilities. The responsibility of the financial institution is to treat its customers fairly and to take the necessary steps to safeguard the customer's information and money, uh, for example, through fraud detection and so on. On the part of the consumer, our obligation is to monitor our accounts regularly, to read the notifications that we receive from the bank, and as well, um, and this is an important one, <laughs> yes. to keep our records with the bank updated so mm. that if the bank sends you notifications, you do receive them. And finally, 
make sure you never reveal your one-time password, your mm. banking login credentials to anybody. Right? And that one is a responsibility that we, the consumers, have. I see. Okay. Well, um, thanks for sharing this, Eunice. And on to um, Nicholas. Usually, when the when when you call your bank and say that an unauthorized transaction has been made, um, the the bank may advise for the consumer to make a police report. When in such a case, like for example, where Joe has already the money the money from his account has already been drained, so when the police asks the the consumer to make a police report. Could you share a little bit more about what are those kind of information that someone like Joe might want to start compiling, like you, like you mentioned earlier? What are some of this information that will be very helpful for the police to do their investigations? So, thanks, thanks to uh, Eunice for sharing some very helpful, helpful information. I think it's a reminder <clears throat> for everyone, right? So, and uh, whether before or after you get uh, uh, scammed, uh, just just be calm. Don't 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 panic, right? Okay. Sometimes, sometimes people uh, can get very nervous, right? Um, uh, to your to your question, Samson, about uh, when you, when you go to the police, right? You have to do it quickly and get get, the, get as much information to the police as possible so that they can inform the bank to stop transaction if it's not too too late, right? So you will help if you have you can bring uh, any information about how you were contacted, where be it email. Telegram, SMS, uh, uh, bring bring those information. Uh, it would probably be helpful if you bring your bank statements, uh, right? And, and any screenshots, that's uh, any, any screenshots, any communication, right? Your mm. your personal uh, uh, information as well, because the, the police will need to verify that your your IDs and, and all that. But but more more important is around as much detailed information around the the transaction that happened or how it happened. I that see. led to money leaving your account, right? I see. Um, yeah, and, okay. and and obviously records from your records from the bank will help us as well in terms of uh, your bank statements. So any screenshots of the account, that's right. and even that's screenshots right. of the the initial SMS that you got. That's right. So if we could maybe pull it up on the on the slide, I think this is one example of uh, a SMS a phishing SMS that's coming from the bank. Uh, or purportedly from the bank. This is precisely like what Eunice has uh, mentioned, that um, the banks starting from, is it this year, earlier this year, that they will no longer send out the any messages with the link, which is like, for example, the one that you see right at the top, the first one, right? Mm. So this, I shouldn't be clicking any of these kind of links. Right? Yes, and um, another tip that I have for mm. consumers, I mentioned just now three things. Yes. The third one is, you can set these um, transaction alerts or transaction limits. Transaction limits. Yes, mm. and that is helpful in your day-to-day -day, mm -hmm. such that um, some people I know set the transaction alert limit to zero. Any little thing they want to know because there can be yeah, I would situations want to know. Yeah, I would right, want to know. where the, at first the scammer tries out a very small amount and yes. then increases. Yes. So set the limit to what you can reasonably monitor. Okay, mm. because... It, if you're not going to monitor at all, then it's not going to be very helpful. Yes. And then also your transaction limits. You can set a limit to the account that can, that for the amount of money that can leave your account for any particular day. Mm. So this will also help to mitigate any loss so that it doesn't exceed a certain amount. Yeah. I see. Mm, but back to this um, that is shown on the screen. So don't click on the links that okay. come from banks. And the other thing to do is when you see a link, do scrutinize it and look at it very carefully. So we see this one, for example, right? It says HTTPS internet alerts dbscom mm. But actually, if we are familiar with the DBS website, this is not the domain name for DBS. The domain name oh. for DBS is dbs.com.sg. I right? see. And so maybe if I could... Uh, say a little bit more about domain names, right? Because yes. this is not a word that we use normally in, in our lives. Yes. But this is one way to look at the internet website, what to look out for. Look out for the word immediately before the .sg, .com, and, and so on. Yeah? That is before the first slash. 
Mm. And this will show you the true domain name that is being used. So I give you an example from the Fidrek website. Yes. If you see www.fidrek.com.sg, you see that before the .com, the word is Fidrek. So Fidrek is the domain name. This is our legitimate Fidrek website. Now you look at the second example, right? It says fidrek.process.com.sg mm. slash home. Oh. oh, it does seem quite legitimate, right? Yeah, it looks like Fidrek yeah. name got Fidrek there. inside. But if you look at it closely, so just look for the first slash and then work behind from there and you see the word before .com is mm. process. It's not Fidrek. So it's the right. word before the dot com, the before. immediately before. Yes, I see. yes, yes, yes. So this is one way that we can check. I used to tell people that you look out for whether it's HTTPS or not because yes. S means the website is secure. secure. But in truth, uh, this doesn't work anymore. Because Even the scammer saw, has upgraded. Yeah, yeah. From the, just now yeah. the example, scammers yeah. have also used a secure website and they find a way to extract the information. They need. I see. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And you know, I and not just from the banks. I think one one thing you mentioned earlier, Eunice, is that um, some organizations, like for example, you mentioned uh, Sing Health, they still continue to send out SMSs. Uh, one example that we see would be from Sing Post, for example, right? Like like now we are shopping online, so I receive a lot of um, messages from the courier and the delivery companies saying that, hey, I've got a package waiting. Some of it really is, I buy one, right? And they do have a link there and they tell me where, where, where's the delivery and I'm always very eager to see when my, whether Christmas came early for my shopping. But, but in, this, in this example that we see on the slide, right? Like how, how should we, you know, like, at which point is it a scam and at which point is it really just about me checking the where my package is. Like, what should I be aware of? Maybe, maybe let me yeah. jump in first on, on this yes, one, right? I'm just looking at the again the scam alert website and looking ah. at what's been reported in the uh, you know past few weeks, past few months. So there were people pretending to be calling from uh, IMF, <laughs> from mm. ICA, a lot mm. from MOH, and there was one example actually from uh, this uh, Sing Post, right? And they said yeah. that it was a receive SMS of parcel collection and put a URL. Say that the parcel is withheld. You have to click on this this mm, link and mm. what this person said was that uh, and also said that, that they will have to pay money like ex additional dollar or something like that mm. and this person actually went to so-called verify ah uh, yeah, verify verify that that the that, 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 that did not come from sing post right and after and he, this person reported it and the site was removed i see so if if i receive an sms from someone who pretends to be sing post saying that I need to pay money, then that's already a red flag. Mm. And then, like what Nicholas and Eunice have shared is, I should verify, right? I should check, I should confirm, right? I should call up who my, that, that courier service is and ask, where's that package? Or oh, just, just go for the general line for a general line, and, and right? just, just uh, independently. Not the link the, look, Not, not yeah, the link. Not that link, right? <laughs> independently yeah. look for the number and call. That's great. Okay. Yes. Now, um, before we move on to the next scenario, uh, just a gentle reminder to our participants that you can continue to post your questions uh, in Pigeon Hole and we would uh, we'll, we try to answer all of them and if they're relevant during this, the, the scenario itself, we'll post it like what we did it just now or otherwise we will have a consolidated Q&A session by the end where we'll go through all the questions that we can. All right, and on to the next scenario. So scenario three, it's an e-commerce scam, just as we are just as we are talking about my holiday shopping. Now, Mary came across an online seller who offered to uh, sell her the latest handphone model, the like iPhone 14, maybe, uh, at a very, very, very low price. Right. And so when she was looking, she was trying to do and check, right? She was trying to check and she saw many reviews praising the products and praising the sellers. So she's kind of thought, yeah, it seems genuine and it's a good deal, it's a bargain. So she chatted with the seller and she was told to make a bank transfer before the phone can be delivered to her. And the seller also told Mary that since the item is being shipped from overseas, it's, it will take some time, around two to three weeks to get to her. And in fact, after she paid the money, she transferred the money um, the seller took a picture of something that appears to be a delivery order or delivery receipt uh, to 
for him to prove that he has shipped the goods. But unfortunately, after one month, she still hasn't received her, her, her handphone that she bought. She tried to then message the seller, but then the line is either busy, couldn't get through, or there was just no response. So in this case, you know, Mary tried what she could do to check, to verify the seller seems legit. You know, the, the phone seems to be a real one. The photo kind of looks real. And she even got the delivery order. She already transferred her money through bank transfer. And now she's kind of stuck. Right. So Nicholas, you know, there's this old saying that goes that, you know, if the deal is too good to be true, it probably is. Now with so many deals, the 9-9 sale, 10-10 sale, and you know, probably the next one will be 11-11 sale. You know, how, you know, what could Mary have done from the start that she hasn't already did? Right now, a good point, right? If the deal is too good to be true, it probably is. Um, in my professional work in the past, I, I worked with a lot of uh, online merchants, online platforms, right? And, and we, we saw a lot of these. Um, e-commerce is one aspect, but also a lot of uh, scams on online travel purchases, mm. air tickets and all that. Those were, those are quite significant as well and many different schemes. I myself, from a personal experience, bought my last three mobile phones uh, through e-commerce oh, wow. uh, platforms, right? And you, you got it successfully. And it was successful. So oh, I can, wow. I can, I can okay. share from personal experience, right? Yeah. Basically, because it's a high ticket item and actually there are some categories that are, yeah. are quite common. So, uh, somehow this uh, mobile phones is 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 one common category. Mm-hmm. Concert tickets seem to be another common category. Mm. Um, air tickets, uh, amusement park tickets seem to be quite common, right? Uh, or rather, always coming up in the top five in terms of uh, items, uh, right? So when you're buying like a a mobile phone, right, a few hundred dollars, a, few, a couple thousand dollars. Uh, what I what I did was I meet up with the seller, <laughs> inspect the device oh, gadget for myself. <laughs> Before I, I hand over the money. Oh. Right. So, oh. so the website is kind of just for you to contact the seller, but the actual exchange happens. Or some platforms they actually offer escrow service. Ah, right? they, they, you, they hold the money for you and then you, you uh, until you receive the goods and they release uh, the money. I see. That was for very high high ticket items. I think I think some platforms are even doing buying and selling of uh, cars and, and all that. So they mm. <laughs> right, right. So so yeah. so uh, yeah, so I think that's the thing. But it's a bit more complicated when it comes to concert tickets. Yeah. Because you could receive the concert tickets and then you can show up at the gate and the ticket doesn't work. Yeah. Right. So actually yeah. I think that one is is uh is um not not a vice. I think just I, I don't know how you know <laughs> yeah. to it's because I think it's just if you ask the, the organizers and all that, they just say they just tell you don't don't buy secondhand yes. uh tickets, right? Yeah, you yeah. The, the, unless they provide unless they encourage you to do it. And they provide a service to help you to verify the ticket when 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 you purchase mm. it. Otherwise, it's, uh, uh, you can't do it. You can't do anything, right? Yeah. You you buy a ticket, and then you you show up the gate, and it can't be used. I see. So Nicholas, you mentioned about this uh, escrow service, mm. or at least the built-in payment service that maybe an e-commerce website may have, right? In this case, um, Mary was contacted by the seller and instructed by the seller to do a bank transfer. And maybe it could be that the seller will say, oh, I'll give you a discount because we can do it out off the site. So, you know, maybe the seller pays less commission or he gives up some story like that to why you should do a bank transfer to transact off the e-commerce site. Right? Is this a red flag or like how should she, you know, how, how should she protect herself, Mary? Yeah, in, in general, you should avoid what we call off-platform transaction. Right, mm-hmm. if you, uh, if if the the seller is very quickly quickly taking the conversation and transaction, say oh to WhatsApp to 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 Telegram or mm-hmm. and, and outside that that should should be a, a ring alarm bell, uh, for for you in a, in a sense. We've also seen schemes where initially they get you to to use a credit card and then mm-hmm. they tell you the transaction fails, and then they ask you to to wire, uh, wire the money. The so now you paid twice. Ah, oh, I see. But but what happens is that uh, they take the cash because you when you wire it, but they don't actually swipe the card. They hold your card information. Three months later, they use it, your card to buy something else mm. for the next guy, and it's it's quite common. Actually, it's quite common, right? They, the first time you said if you, you buy let's say a a phone, you yeah. you swipe your credit card, and then you say oh transaction failed. Can you make a payment using bank transfer? 
I so see. they didn't actually uh, swipe your card, right? You they but they collected your money using the bank transfer, and they have your card information now. They they they've kept it, and they use it a few months later for to for another transaction. I see. Actually, Unisys is also a very interesting question that's, that's now to you, right? Because Nicholas mentioned that um, your, some of the sellers, they may accept your credit card payment and then later they tell you that, it's, that it bounced when actually it went through, then they ask you to pay a second time. Um, in, in your work with Fidrek, this, this would be something that Fidrek would help to mediate between the financial institution, the one issuing the credit card, and the consumer, right? Mm. Um, one question that came out from, from the audience today is that um, when he called the bank to tell them about suspected fraud on his credit card, mm. he saw many transactions done without his knowledge. And um, the bank in turn asked him, why does he think it's a fraud? So what should he do in this scenario? Mm. So Samson, just to give you uh, another perspective on this, when you can imagine if you put yourself in the shoes of a bank and you have many, many potential customers yeah. coming to you to say this transaction is a fraud, mm. you need to find some way of uh, checking. Yeah. Otherwise, you yourself might become a victim of, of fraud. The bank becomes a victim of the fraud. Yes. Yeah. So I at Fitrack, what we see very often is that the banks will ask for information and they will also ask if the customer has made a police report right mm. and a police report is a, a way that the bank can can roughly see that you know you have genuinely been the victim and that mm. you have gone to the police to report this crime yeah I see. so for credit card transactions that you see that are unauthorized you should definitely get a police report and go to the bank with that report and tell them about this unauthorized transaction. If between you and the bank, you are not able to resolve the dispute, then that is when you come to FIDREC. Do remember that uh, you should come to FIDREC within six months from the bank giving you their final reply. Okay? Mm. And when we try and mediate these cases, often in terms of the law, the law in for credit card um, transactions is governed by the contract between me, the customer, and my card issuing bank. And the contract usually puts the responsibility on me, the consumer, right, to make sure I monitor my transactions and to report them immediately if they are unauthorized. But most banks will have a clause that will limit your liability for unauthorized transactions to $100 if you report immediately. Mm. You can show evidence that the transaction is unauthorized and you yourself, you were not negligent, right? Mm. An example of negligence would be if I left my credit card in a public place, I see. right? And I did not look after it or I passed it to someone. Then, then the bank might say, oh, that was negligent conduct on your part as well. Mm. So I may not be willing to limit your liability because you have not fulfilled the three conditions right? I that, that I have set before I limit your liability. So if the seller asked me to SMS him or WhatsApp him my 16-digit card number and the three-digit security code, that would mean I'm negligent if I actually send it to the seller? So if the seller is yeah. not a legitimate seller, right? I see. then you might well for, find yourself in the situation that Nicholas described. Yeah. Right? They, they just deduct from your payments, yeah. whether then and then and then or later for other things. I see. So it is very important to make sure that the seller is a reputable and legitimate seller. So mm. the tips that Nicholas gave were to do your own checks, right? Check for the reviews. Make sure you use, you know, reputable sites, legitimate sellers. And another tip, right, that I can give, uh, apart from Nicholas's one about, uh, you know, doing a inspection meet in person before yes. the money leaves your hands, right, yep. is to pay through secured means. So, for example, if you pay through a bank transfer, the bank transfer is instantaneous. It doesn't require a human to approve the transfer. Mm. It go the money is gone. It's gone. Yeah. But yep. if you pay by a credit card, right, and then later you find out that the good was not delivered, you can go to your card issuing bank 
and raise what is called a chargeback request. And this means you are asking your card issuing bank to go to Visa or MasterCard or whoever the card association is to tell them that you, the customer, are disputing the transaction for the reason that maybe the good was not delivered. And under the dispute resolution rules of Visa or MasterCard, they can reverse the transaction. Hmm. And so using secured means that doesn't require cash to leave you immediately gives you one more chance you know, at trying to recover the money in the event there's a scam. I see. And Eunice, on this question, uh, on this point, sometimes the line is really thin, right? When we are asking for like what we call a chargeback or, re- or like a refund type of request, um, the, the line is really thin between when it's just maybe a business dispute. Like for example, if I ordered a blue t-shirt, but it came out red t-shirt, is that a scam? You know, versus um, maybe I ordered a blue t-shirt and they gave me a cup. Mm-hmm. Or they gave me a blue t-shirt and they gave me nothing after one month. So the, the line is really thin. Like from, from your experience, what, what, at which point does it really look more like a scam? And which point is it really just a business dispute for which the bank also might not be in a position to help um, mm-hmm. authorize a charge bank? Well, I'll yeah. share some thoughts, then maybe I'll throw it to Nicholas because yeah. he will have some stories on this too. Excellent. Well, where I think it crosses the line and becomes a scam yeah. is one one big warning sign is if the seller is uncontactable. You mm. cannot reach them, you cannot contact them to negotiate or to discuss the problem. Then it is quite likely that you have fallen victim to a scam. I see. But you may not be able to tell, right? But generally what you do if you encounter any problems with your e-commerce, and we will have actually another webinar on Wednesday, just focus on online shopping. (laughs) So stay tuned for that. But the first thing you do is you go to the seller and you tell them the problem and you see whether you can resolve with them directly. Hmm. If you cannot Right. This is when you can escalate to perhaps if you paid by a credit card to your card issuing bank, you see whether you can activate the dispute resolution process under the Visa rules or the MasterCard rules. Okay, And if that doesn't work out for you and you truly feel that you are a victim of crime, right? you can report to the police. If it is a really large sum, you can also seek advice from a lawyer to see what steps you can do in terms of a civil claim, meaning you can try and sue this person. But of course, the difficulty is getting a hold of this person Mm. if he or she is uncontactable and not in Singapore. So that will be problematic. I see. Next next thing is, you know, uh, I I used to work for Visa, right? So uh, besides the scams and and fraud, uh, we have other terms like uh, goods not delivered. Mm. Or uh, even what we call buyer's remorse, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. right. And, I see. Um, so uh, it's quite complex. And actually, the industry has a, a way of what we call shifting liability, <laughs> right? And and this route resolution is quite complex between between the buyer, the seller, the buyer's bank, the seller's bank, and the, and the intermediary third party platforms and all that. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's it's quite 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 complex. I think um, to to one of uh, Unisys' first point, right? The, it's best that when you're engaging in the transaction, right, to, to, to really ask, check, confirm, that's, that's one thing. And I would agree that even though I, I mentioned my example was when I buy a high-ticket item um, from a third-party platform, like, like a mobile phone, I, I would go and check myself and, and I'd rather pay, pay, pay cash or, or, you know, so when goods delivered, I pay cash. But I actually agree that it's actually better to, to still pay by card, but at least you have a chance yeah, of recovering, <laughs> right, your, yeah. your, your, your money, right, through, through, through raising a, Charge track dispute. I, I, I've had personally. I've had unsuccessful charge track disputes. Uh, uh, mm. uh, I've raised unsuccessful charge back requests before personally. Right. So it's not easy as as, as you mentioned, but it's better than not having a a, a chance. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Once you put up release a uh, cash, it's, it's gone. Mm. And Nicholas, on this point, one of the questions that came in from the audience was um where they mentioned. In a marketplace, like for example, Carousel or any of those like secondhand type of um, marketplace trading sites, um, the question was, uh, who can ask for the money? Like, should the should the buyer insist on delivery first, or should would they 
or can the seller insist that they need to be paid first before delivery? Because you can see from a seller's point of view, if I mean the seller being a legitimate seller, he's also worried that if he ship the goods over to you, then if the person end up never pay, then he's gonna be he he lost, he has been scammed, right? And I think the same problem is facing the buyer, right? If I send you the money and you don't send me the goods. So short of what you say, right, Nicholas, where you face-to-face meet up and do the exchange, right? Short of that, I think the question that the audience was asking, like, who can ask for the, who's in the right? Like, what, 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 should, what should we do? It's a bit hard to comment on, on individual yeah. uh, platforms, right? And everyone has their business model. And uh, uh, I think in this case, let's say the example of a uh, uh, Carousel and uh, what the question is referring to. I think it's always good to check the reputation of both the platform and the seller. The platform and the seller, right? Uh, yeah. I think that's 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 one. Mm. And the other thing is to think about the the quantum, right? Which is, I think, like say in my case, if I'm buying a thousand dollar phone, I I I want to be sure. But if mm. it's a, I don't know, a two dollar. Uh, hair clip or something, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, if the seller is saying that uh, you have to pay, otherwise I, w- I won't ship. And then you look at the reputation, it's, o- it's okay. I, I, from a personal point of view, I, w- I, I might consider taking uh, the, the risk. risk. Yeah. But a good platform should actually not, not uh, have you put you in the kind of dilemma. Mm. Right? It should provide mm. tools and solutions for you to be able to make those transactions. So it's a bit hard to comment on individual platforms. I see. Okay. Well, thanks for thanks for your response, Nicholas. Um, now we move on to the last scenario for today. So scenario four is an investment scam. And that's the, 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 the fourth largest one that we have in 2022. So in this case, um, Audrey is looking to sell her retail business because COVID has affected her business really badly. And so when she was being referred to an agent, uh, the, her agent referred her to a Chinese businessman who appears to be very keen to buy her retail business. And this Chinese businessman then told uh, Audrey that he wasn't able to come to Singapore because of travel restrictions. And so she, he, in proceeding with the transaction, Audrey then asked him, how about you give me your identity card and what's your own business? And so Audrey could try to verify and confirm is this a legitimate buyer of her business. So during the course of this transaction, the, the, the businessman, her, the buyer, uh, communicated really frequently with her. And he, uh, the, the, the businessman was trying to introduce Audrey to like why he became so rich, right? He was trying to say that, oh, he did this kind of uh, investments and, and he was um, prompting Audrey to perhaps consider. And he gave her a link to register for this investment site. And in this investment site, Audrey was required to pay like a sign up fee, a sign up administrative fee of like $500. And then she was supposed to invest. Of course, some one variation of this is that the Chinese businessman might already like front the money, might, might give her the money and say, hey, you know, it's really good. Uh, I'm going to put in some money for you anyway because I'm going to buy your business. So he might already put it onto the platform. And then Audrey starts seeing that her investment in this uh, investment site starts increasing in value. So she thinks it's real, right? And when, as with anything with the scams, when she sees the money is, is there, she tries to withdraw it. Maybe the first time can get through, but subsequently when she tries to withdraw the larger amount of her investments, she realized that the website either is down or she couldn't contact anyone and none of the money is coming back. And that was the case. And she even tried contacting the agent that referred her to this businessman. And he's also uncontactable. So that's, that's um, you know, this is one variation of the investment scam. Uh, the investment scams come in many, many, many different flavors. Um, but this one example Nicholas, in this situation, you know, what do you think Audrey could have done? She tried her checking, she tried her asking, right? But what do you think she could have done differently? Well, first of all, if you look at um, uh, the stats, right, up to, up to December last year, and, and you did share earlier uh, some of the, the stats for first half of, 
of uh, 2022, mm. uh, there were more than 2,000 cases of investment scams reported. The total amount lost was a stagger, <clears throat> close to 200 million. $190 million was uh, $190 million reported dollars. Reported it lost, reported lost lost, investment scams. Uh, investment scams. Wow. And the highest single single case was actually $6.4 million. In a single in a, scam? In, in a single scam, right? Wow. So we're talking about very, very large amounts here. And is if Audrey was selling her business, it sounds like it could possibly mm. be in the millions too. I think, uh, let's talk about Audrey's case, right? It, it, it's a little bit surprising because she sounded like she was, uh, she got off on a rabbit trail somewhere. She yeah. was looking to sell her business, but she ended up investing yes. in somebody else's uh, business and all that. So a bit distracted in a sense. But uh, normally in this situation, you would have to hire professionals, right? To be, to be involved in the transaction. If it's legitimate, you know, both sides are hiring professionals to go through due diligence and, mm. and going through uh, legal documentation and paperwork and all that. So that looked like it was, uh, it was missing in, in, in this case. Um, you know, but some of the other kind of tall tale signs or, or things that you watch out for is normally these are very high value. Quite commonly, we are seeing like reports of like um, investment scams around like crypto, mm. uh, binary options uh, coming from uh, unfamiliar entities outside of of, of Singapore. It's, it's it's quite common. So I think you just have to be very very clear minded, right? Uh, have to really really check, understand the risk, really really understand the risks behind some of these uh, uh, investments and uh, get get professional help. Hmm. Eunice, what do you think? Yes, I think we can try and apply the ask, check, confirm three steps, mm. right? So in this situation, Audrey might ask more about this cryptocurrency investment. Mm. What is the company that's holding her investment? Is it based in Singapore? Is it based overseas? If it is based overseas, then you know that when you want to try and recover money, it is even more difficult because you would need to try and get lawyers from that other country to try mm. and get you know, the police authorities yes. from that country involved. So it becomes a more complicated affair. The other thing to look out for when you are checking right, is to find out whether you have enough information about cryptocurrency or whatever investment product is being offered because you might think oh cryptocurrency sounds like a good investment because you know it sounds like currency right sounds mm. like real money sounds mm. like something good you've seen it on social media but do you truly understand what it is right mm. so i think with investments the checking um, you can always check with a professional, like Nicholas has suggested, a financial advisor who's licensed, right? Or you could check with people you trust, your friends and family, okay? Mm. So cryptocurrency, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has sounded big, loud warnings about that. It's not suitable for retail investors. It is not backed by a concrete asset, right? It's very speculative in nature and the value goes up and down okay mm. so i think whenever you encounter a new kind of investment product there might be a temptation that oh uh, fear of missing out i want to get in early so i can make the most money possible but when you do so recognize that you are taking a risk yeah mm. and when you want to do the confirmation the last step one thing to do with investments is to check against the Monetary Authority of Singapore Investor Alert List. Investor Alert List. Mm, this is a website that the Monetary of Singapore puts up and lists various uh, companies that have you know, tried to suggest to the public that they are licensed by the authority, but they are in fact not. Okay? Mm. In fact, there is a financial institutions directory on the MAS website, mas.gov.sg, and that will be a comprehensive full list of all the licensed financial institutions. Mm. When you deal with a non-licensed financial institution, you are taking a big risk <laughs> mm. because with licensed financial institutions, MAS has certain requirements of them. So if you go into a get into a dispute and you sue them, they are you they are likely able to you know compensate you for something. Mm. But if you go against an unlicensed entity, then there's a lot of difficulty. The other perspective from the feedback angle is we can only handle disputes against licensed entities. Mm. Because for the non-licensed ones, um, 
they can just ghost us. They don't have to respond to us. There's yes. no way we can get them to come to Fidra and participate, right? So if you're dealing with licensed financial institutions, you know that there is a dispute resolution process like FIDREC, you no know, free for you to use in the event you get into a dispute. So do check on that and confirm it against the official MAS source. I see. Good, that, that's a good point, um, Eunice, because there's, there's this one question from the audience, which was precisely on this point, like what happens if he's dealing with an unlicensed financial institution? Um, so your 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 suggestion to them is um, don't deal with or um, deal it at your own risk. Deal at your own risk because that's right. there will be, Fidrek may not be able to help you for those that are not licensed here in Singapore. Even if they are licensed overseas, but they're not licensed in Singapore. Correct. Worse off, they're not licensed at all. Mm. It's going to be very challenging. That's right. Uh, and also check the MES website on whether they are on the investment alert list. Mm. So that's like the blacklist, right? In, in some it, sense. In a way that, I mean, these would be companies that create the impression that they are licensed but are not. Mm. So it's just a reminder to you that even if a company suggests they might mm. not be so bold as to place on their website that they are yeah. licensed, but they might say, so for example, we recently at Pidrek had to deal with this website that said for dispute resolution, you may contact Pidrek. We oh, put our number there. But they are actually not a licensed financial so entity, Fidre whether in Singapore or anywhere else. I see. Exactly. So those are, you know, false statements that can be placed online that we have to be careful of as consumers. So what can a victim do if they have been tricked by one of these kind of like un, either an unlicensed financial institution or a, a, a scam altogether? Mm. What, so what can do? the first thing to do is you try and contact the institution you're dealing with. Okay. Right? To try and resolve it directly. If you cannot get hold of anybody, then you report to the police. Right? You have been a victim of a fraud or a scam. And then the steps are, as we, we talked about just now, you go to the police with all the information you can possibly gather. Mm -hmm. And then the police, if they are able to recover anything, then there are procedures in place for any recovered monies to be distributed to the victims. Right? And if the money is not enough, the court can give directions as to how much each will get. Mm. There's also the possibility of going to a lawyer to try and bring a claim in court, but that will require you to be able to identify the other party so that mm. you can sue them. Yeah? Uh, and, but for this, you have to seek legal advice. Uh, if it's unlicensed, FIDREC is, is not a platform you can you know, avail yourself of. So it becomes very, very difficult to recover anything. Yeah. I see. So deal at your own risk for this. Deal at your own risk if I it's unlicensed. Yeah. Okay. And so now, now it's time for us to move on to our last section of uh, today's webinar, which is the open Q&A section. And let's consider some of the questions that has been submitted by the audience. And as a reminder to the audience, um, you can continue submitting your uh, questions over at pigeonhole.at. And for this, uh, perhaps for the first question that has been the most upvoted, and this I, I guess I, I might pose it to Eunice. The first question is... <laughs> Um, the, the audience member has given feedback that he tried to call the bank to verify whether the SMS they receive is from them. However, it is so difficult to contact or reach someone from the call center and he doesn't know what he should do in that situation. So since um, the latest measures that uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Association of Banks in Singapore have rolled out, there should be a dedicated fraud or scam hotline that you can call to be able to access help more quickly. Right? Mm. But another tip that I have for you is there's no hurry to act on the message. Okay? Often, scammers will play on fear and they will put pressure on the victim to force quick action, right? Then we do not think through, we don't ask, we just act quickly, yeah? Mm. So there is no harm just waiting. 
wait and see, right? Mm. So the message might say, oh, if you don't verify your account, your account will be closed. Yeah. Will it? You wait a day or two, you know? <laughs> if nothing happens, you are fine, right? Mm. Um, but if this is something very important to you, right? For instance, you need the account for your business purposes, for transactions and so on. Then you try and contact the bank through the call center. If you cannot get through to the call center and you think this is sort of a scam situation, try and contact the dedicated fraud or scam hotline. Yeah. I but see. do not act just because you feel some pressure, right? Mm. Normally, uh, even if it is true that there is something that has happened that the bank is contacting you for, they will contact you again if you don't respond. And again, right? I see. <laughs> they won't close down your won't... account tomorrow. Uh. Exactly. I see. Exactly. Yes. Okay. If I can add also, I think yes. Um, in this example, this question, I think the person was calling the bank asking, did you send me an SMS? Maybe yes. a better question to ask is pertaining to the content of the SMS. Like, oh, something wrong with this your account. You need to, you need to uh, maybe your your contact information needs to be updated. Ask the bank about about that when you mm. call. Say, do you need me to update my contact information or something regarding ah, the content of the SMS? Right. I think it, it will be easier for the probably for the call center officer to 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 see if this if if your some irregularity with your account. I see. Right. I see. Okay. And and one one thing I then remembered, Eunice, that you shared earlier today was um if there is a link in the SMS, it's probably not from your bank. Mm, that's right. I see. So number one is um don't um don't get pressurized, right? Uh, if the, the 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 message claims that you need to like do something, otherwise your account will get closed, and then click on this link, but then probably that's not real because there shouldn't be a link. Uh, and then number two, don't be pressurized because your account won't really just get immediately closed out in one day. Mm -hmm. The bank will continue to try to reach you. And then to what Nicholas is saying, when you do contact the bank, perhaps ask specifically what was stated in that SMS. Like, is it you really going to close down my account? Like, what's the issue here? Right? I see. Okay. And now on to the, uh, the next upvoted question. Um, this one has to do with the, the job scams. So the, the question here is, uh, he wishes to earn additional income by doing online surveys. So how, how can he avoid a scam when doing online surveys? And there are... HTTPS website states that they can only give their survey earnings via bank account transfers. And so I, presumably that's where they ask for your details. So what can they give? What should we, if we are trying to sign up for doing earning money by doing surveys, what can we give? What should we give? And then what should we look as a red flag? Well, uh, I'll start first, right? Yeah. This scenario sounds like it could be a legitimate scenario, mm. but it's also good that this uh, this audience, this, this viewer, is uh, trying to be very safe. I think yes. I, I think it's good. Uh, if I was in in your shoes, I think one thing I I would do is I will check uh, independently, maybe uh, Google or through other other people who have uh, used the service, right? Uh, find different ways to triangulate to see if this is a real service right right um, and, and or, or you can even just google and, and maybe other people who've been scammed will leave reviews to say that this is a scam site ah <laughs> right it's a fake service it's a, it's a fake yeah. service site you can check independently through google through uh, others who have used service uh, or friends and all that whether this is legitimate and you know what if this is a legitimate service maybe when you ask around your friends some some people will say oh i've used it and i've got paid mm. right so it was, I mean, there are legitimate survey companies around. One question I might try to ask is um, why only bank transfer and why uh, can I come and pick up a check from you? Mm. Right? Or some, something like that, right? Try, try to test and see whether they would offer an alternate payment method and why not. Mm. Yeah, so I think this audience member is very good, commendable. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah, sure. wow. Very, very happy with you. <laughs> Excellent. But don't rely only on the HTTPS right. because ah. we've, our experience has been that HTTPS is not something that guarantees 
that the site is safe. I right? see. So do your independent checks. Um, nowadays, we also have, in Singapore at least, pay now, right? Yes. Which is sometimes, uh, you know, what I, I offer. Sometimes if I don't want to give out my bank account information. I see. Right? I, I personally, I avoid that whenever possible. Mm. Um, but of course, the other thing is, perhaps giving your once you've verified the identity of this company, it's a reputable one, regularly does surveys um, and they offer different payment methods, right? Then maybe you can feel a bit more assured, right? Um, but if not, right, uh, it depends on your own level and appetite for risk. Mm. Is it worth your while to give out your bank account information for $10, $20? You, you have to do that risk assessment because mm. you as the consumer, once you give out your own information, you are responsible for it. Yeah. I see. And Eunice, but, but on this point right, of like, how do you get paid? Um, I guess also maybe the question is like, what exactly is the kind of bank information you're giving to them? So for example, if let's say it's a foreign site, they may not have a pay now option. They may use the more traditional way, like, you know, what is your bank account number so that I can pay you the money? Right? Even until today, I guess HR departments, when they pay you your payroll, they also ask for your bank account number. I guess one thing that they will probably never ask you for is like your username and password for the iBanking. So I guess that, that might be a red flag. That might, that, that's definitely <laughs> a, a red flag, Sam. So thank yeah. you for pointing that out. Never give your you your online login, right? Your online login. Mm. Yes, but the bank account details is a matter of personal preference, I think. I see. Yeah, because with your company, when you are, you know, being paid for your salary, yes, you have this employment contract <laughs> that you can rely on, right? <laughs> I see. But for this sort of survey transaction, um, it is a risk you bear, and you think whether that the amount is worth it. And Eunice, yeah. for for let's say if I had given out my bank account number, right, like one two three four five six seven, right. But, but if that was the only thing I put in, I put, okay, my bank account, DBS, bank number 1234567, can they do anything about it? Like, like can a scammer like come into my bank account and take the money out just because they know my bank account number? Let's throw this maybe, to maybe, the yeah. technology oh, uh, expert. Yes. Um, technically, what you described is not, not, not possible. Mm. But I have spoken to one of the world's best hacker once. He won this competition called DEFCON. Yes. And by winning it, it means that he was able to crack into a Fortune 500 company like, uh, I think his, his one was Coca-Cola. Mm. And the way they run these competitions is that is how efficiently and effectively you can capture key personal information I see. along the way. So bank account details actually is considered quite critical information. Mm. You can't do anything with it by itself. But if you, if you have that, and then you have the person's address, you have uh, other information, mm. you could potentially reset the person's account. For example, ah, I see. Right. One normally is, it, it looks quite harmless, like, oh, just a uh, bank account details, I can't do anything yeah. with it. But but in this case, um, this this hacker, he was able to capture 20 information that allow him to crack to get access to the Coca-Cola's core server administrator password. Oh, I see. And it's it's like a, a chess game, right? He said, yeah. I captured this and I'm, I'm now able to know this and I know the CEO's address and I know this and eventually managed to get access to this, oh. the password of the server. So it's, it's, it's difficult for us to understand. Yeah. yeah. But um, I think the rule of thumb is that any personal information should not uh, it's risky when it when it's when it's uh, taken by by hackers or by then that's really interesting, yeah, kids. Nicholas. So it's like the, the bank account number in and of itself, it's probably not very like it, it it's not gonna cause you to lose money just because someone knows your bank account number. But what you've highlighted was that in combination of other things they find out about That's you, right. like they they somehow find out your date of birth, they somehow find out your NRC number, they somehow find out your address, and now they call your bank. Pretending to be you, that's right. Telling them, telling the bank officer that I'm referring to my bank account one two three or five. I live at this place. Here's my NRC number. Then they have tricked the bank officer into exactly. thinking that it's yours, and from there they compromise your account. Uh, so it's not not so much the specific small little bank information that you give, but if some scammer or some hacker is determined enough to form a whole picture of you, 
when used in conjunction with your other personal information, it starts to get a little bit more risky. You could be a very small node in a very big web. Yeah. Right. It's like in his case, I think in this hacker's case, to, to get into the server of Coca-Cola, for example, he I think he went through the janitor, <laughs> went through the, 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 the CEO's assistant, yeah. and, and he built his built his, he, he worked his way in, right? Mm. Okay. Great. Uh the, the next question that we have from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. It's relating to some of the recent cases reported about the compromised SingPass accounts. Now we know that we almost everything we do using SingPass. Yeah? We can sign up new bank accounts using SingPass. We log into some of our accounts using SingPass. And it's quite scary to hear that people's SingPass is now been compromised or they've been tricked to give up their SingPass. Um, this was, in fact, I think the audience member was sharing that it was reporting the news yesterday. That's right, that's right. Eunice, what can we do to protect our SingPass access? Mm. So I think for the SingPass, the thing I shared about checking the domain name becomes mm. very important because if you are not on the SingPass domain, mm. then that should ring alarm bells, right? So we should always look out for the .gov, .sg, right? For the legitimate government-related websites. So if you receive a link, right? And you go there and they try and fish for your SingPass information. It looks like the SingPass site. Mm. And you're supposed to key in your SingPass details. Or they give you the QR code and they ask you to scan oh, the... Correct. Yeah. So whether you're scanning or you are looking at the website address, I see. check for the domain name. That should... That is still a way where you can feel relatively safe about the transaction. Yeah. Mm. Nicholas, okay. you have any other thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a new scheme and we've been busy. I've just been reading up on it as well. Yeah. And basically, it's like a, a spoofing, right? Of, mm. um, yeah. you know, a form of uh, phishing almost, right? Mm. Where they tell you to go uh, up. They say your SingPass account will be deactivated if you don't click on this link. Well, first of all, SingPass mm. should not and do not send you Links. Yes. I think that's that's the important thing, and after that you 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 log in, and next thing you know, what uh, I think was reported was that uh, they were informed that oh their SingPass details details have been changed, or they have been signed up for new bank accounts or new credit cards or mm -hmm. and all that. So so basically, um, the information has been collected and used for 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 something else. I think the important thing to note note here is really that uh, SingPass does not send send you SMS. Uh, containing this uh this this web web links and it's in, it's important to be alert, uh and some of these uh as as Unis's point right they they um the 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 send sender identity right it's similar to SingPass is like my SingPass or yes. SG SingPass and, and all that so just be really alert. I see. And and one other tip is, it is still more secure to deal with the official app, mm. right? Mm. So rather than you know, I you click on a link to I go see. to a site. If you are dealing with a SingPass, use your SingPass app. So mm. I would say similar to um, internet banking, the app is still more secure currently than the website. I Websites see. are not difficult to replicate and, and spoof nowadays. Mm. So if our audience, you know, is willing to try something new, it might be worth your while to download the official apps of your bank, right, of SingPass, and use that. Yeah. Well, thank you, Eunice. Thank you, Nicholas. Well, we have come to the end of our Q&A session. And if at this point, Nicholas, Eunice, if we have like one key takeaway for our audience here later tonight, um, what would it be? Nicholas, if I may start with you. Well, from NCPG, we, we have this slogan, right? Uh, spot the signs, stop the crime, right? Uh, if you're in doubt, right? Call our hotline, uh, 1-800-722-6688. Uh, go to our website, uh, scamalert.sg, right? Okay, so educated or report or share your story. And uh, as most importantly, uh, if you haven't downloaded uh, Scam Shoe, it's now available on Android, so you should download it. Thank you. Eunice? I would uh, repeat my ask, check, confirm, and I also credit Money Sense for this. It's, it's not my original uh, <laughs> creation. Yeah. Really, 
don't let someone rush you into a decision, right? Pause, you know, ask questions, check, confirm against official sources. That is a, a good way to keep yourself safe. And of course, look out for your friends and family, right? Keep in touch with them, especially those who may be a bit more vulnerable, whether it's because of age, because of language or other reasons. Keep an eye out on them. We, we can help each other that way. Yeah. Excellent. Well, what a fantastic session. I'm sure all of us here in the audience here today uh, are much better prepared to spot and avoid scams. And at the end of this webinar, uh, we'll be sending along a survey form that will be popping up on your screen. And uh, we really appreciate your feedback and your completion for this survey so that we can improve our future webinars. And there are many more webinars that are scheduled uh, as part of the Law Awareness Weeks at CDC 2022. Please scan the QR code here on the slide uh, or visit our website uh, at the at the bit.ly link that you see there to find out more about our other webinars. Lastly, I'd like to express my gratitude to both Eunice and Nicholas for joining us here today. And with that, we thank you all for tuning in. Have a great week ahead. Thank you, Samson. Thank you, thank you, Samson. Thank you, Richard. Good night, everyone.